Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to stand up here. Um, much of what I'm going to uh, talk about today, actually, I go into much greater detail in a white paper that I co-authored with Michael Cannon from the Cato Institute, which you could access at the Cato website, just uh, cato.org slash drug reformation. Uh, I had put a couple of hard copies out uh, for those of you who were interested. I think they're gone already, but, but you could get uh, the PDF version. Uh, much of what uh, I'm about to talk about came from a, a thought experiment that I had um, that got me thinking about this and led eventually to the, to the, uh, to the production of the white paper. I was one day I was thinking about how wouldn't it be wonderful if finally we legalized all the drugs that are currently illegal and ended the war on drugs. And then I said, well, you know what? That's going to create a weird situation. We're going to have a situation where, um, like in, in the United States now, where, where uh, marijuana has been legalized, I think we're almost ready, uh, where people have been able to go into uh, um, uh, stores or dispensaries, as some places call them, and buy legal marijuana. Well, we'll probably have places, if, if we legalized all the illegal drugs now, then there'll be pe people could go into a dispensary and purchase some cocaine or purchase uh, some heroin, for example, uh, without any, uh, any fear. And then I thought to myself, well, that would be kind of a weird paradox, wouldn't it? So in other words, if I want to buy cocaine or heroin, I just can go into a store and buy it. But if I want to buy an op another opioid like uh, Percocet, oxycodone, or uh, morphine, I have to get a permission slip from a doctor called a prescription in order to get it. So in a way, using drugs that are currently illegal, I have more freedom if they were legalized than if I use drugs that are currently legal. And I got that, that's what got me thinking about this whole thing uh, in the first place. So, uh, then I, so that got me uh, realizing that this whole notion of where nowadays in the United States and, and in most of the, of the world, people have to actually go to another autonomous adult and get a permission slip in order to get a medication to put into their own body for whatever reason. It could be for medication or it could be for recreation. For whatever, for whatever reason they want to put a substance into their own body, they have to get permission from another adult that's just as, you know, they're just as autonomous as this adult. Okay, we're almost there, right? Hi. Okay. So there we go, okay? So for example, you'd be able to just walk into a store and buy methamphetamine, ecstasy, MDMA, uh, psychedelics. But if you want Xanax or Prozac or oxycodone or hydrocodone, you've got to get a prescription. And I thought, that, that's strange. How do we ever get into this situation? And then I started doing some research. And, and then I talked to my colleague, who's technically my boss at the Cato Institute, Michael Cannon. And it led to this white paper called Drug Reformation. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. Um, uh, uh, the right to self-medicate actually has historically was, was so, so evident to people that Thomas Jefferson, this is a quote, and of course this is in 19th century English, so it's not as easy to follow. Bottom line is Thomas Jefferson repeatedly would speak to audiences in, in uh, early American days and colonial days to try to persuade them how important it is to protect the right to free speech. That the right to free speech, he would say, is as fundamental and sacred as the right to self-medicate. Because he understood his audience at that time, understood, was given how fundamental it is to self-medicate. So he was using that as an example. So now in a, in a, in a modern 20, 21st century, actually, but by the mid 20th century, we, came, we made a 360 degree turn and now we have to explain to people that the right to self-medicate is as fundamental as your right to free speech. We made a completely, completely free circle. Now, there's an excellent book I would like to commend to you. This book also influenced me a lot and had a lot to do with, with the formation of the white paper um, called Pharmaceutical Freedom, Why Patients Have a Right to Self-Medicate. Some of you may be familiar with Jessica Flanagan. She's a professor of philosophy at the University of Richmond. She's done a lot of work for the Institute for Humane Studies. She's a libertarian. And uh, this is a, a very readable philosophy book, not a policy book. And you learn a lot about the, the right to self-medicate in this book. And interestingly, um, it's, it's a corollary of the right to informed consent. 
Now, nowadays, I think, in, I would, uh, I assume, in, in, in all of the world, it's, uh, it's a, there's a consensus of medical ethics that every individual has the right to inform consent. That that a healthcare practitioner can't do something to another person without them giving their informed consent because they own their bodies. But believe it or not, that's a very recent development. In the United States, there was a very famous case, a woman named Mary Schloendorf in the early 20th century, who uh, her, her doctor wanted to perform an examination of her under anesthesia because he thought she might have a tumor of her uterus, but he needed her asleep so he could do a better exam. We do that a lot of times in medicine. It's called exam under anesthesia. So he asked for permission, and she said, stipulated specifically, I'll give you permission, but if you find something, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to wake me up and then discuss it with me. I don't want you to proceed with anything until I give you my, my permission. You're only permitted to, to examine me. Well, he examined her. He felt, found a, a tumor of the uterus. So he opened her up and did hysterectomy on her. And then she had complications. She survived, but she was very upset, as you might imagine. Now, this was commonplace in those days. The doctor knows best. These are just lay people. They don't understand. They don't know what's good for them. So she sued and went all the way up to the, the state Supreme Court in New York, where she was, and uh, uh, she won. And Judge uh, Benjamin Cardozo, who later became a Supreme Court justice, was famous for saying that every individual has complete ownership of their body and you have no right to assault them by doing something in their body without their permission. Well, the right to self-medicate is just a corollary of that. So let me give you uh, an example. I'll give you, uh, and this is taken from Jessica Flanagan's book, so I'm giving her full credit. So she talks about two people, Danny and Debbie. So Debbie uh, goes to uh, uh, a doctor and uh, she has diabetes and he puts her on a, a, doc, a diet to try to get it controlled and a, an exercise regimen. And, and no, no matter what she's doing and, and some certain medications, it's, it's not working. She needs to go on insulin. So he tells her, we're going to have to put you on insulin uh, because nothing else is working. And she says, uh, I'm sorry, but I don't want to go on insulin because uh, I got, first of all, I have a fear of needles. I'm never going to be able to inject myself. And I've heard some, this is reminiscent of the vaccine debate. I've, I've heard some horror stories about what insulin can do to you. And I just will not, I refuse to, to uh, take insulin. Everyone would agree today, and this would happen today, the doctor would document well that I tried my best to convince her so that if something goes wrong, you can't hold me responsible. But I have to respect that she would refuses insulin, so we'll try the next best thing, okay? Now you got Danny comes in, same situation. He's diagnosed with diabetes, and the doctor says, you know, I got good news for you. I, could, I, could, I think we could avoid putting you on insulin if we put you on a strict diet and exercise regimen. And uh, Danny says, doc, I appreciate that, but I know me. I hate exercise. Uh, I love eating. There's no way I'm going to be able to comply with any regimen. Let's just cut to the chase. Give me insulin, because I know that's the only thing that's going to work for me. And the doctor in today's world could say, no, I refuse to let you have insulin. I will not give you permission. So you can see how, what's the difference, right? Informed consent versus uh, the right to self-medicate. So I can't do anything to you without your consent, but I could deny you from doing something to yourself without my consent. That makes no sense. So how did we get to this situation? Well, I'm, the reason I'm using the US Food and Drug Administration as example is unfortunately, uh, that's one of America's biggest exports. Virtually every country in the world has adopted uh, variations of the US Food and Drug Administration model. Um, and uh, even uh, some, some countries, particularly in Latin America, Mexico, some parts of Asia, they have their countries have their version of the US FDA, uh, and they also have prescription requirements, but in some, in many countries, I, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but even though officially you can't get uh, drugs from a pharmacist in Colombia without, you know, certain drugs without a prescription, in many parts of the country, that's not really enforced, and you could just walk in and to discuss with a pharmacist, and the pharmacist will give you what you want, although technically they're not allowed to do that. In some countries like Mexico, you don't need prescription for anything except antibiotics. And uh, don't, don't even forget to mention, there could be an exception for antibiotics on, in this thing. 
Well, so th that's why I'm going to talk about the U.S. model. So up until 1906, um, there was no regulation on pharmaceuticals in the United States. That doesn't mean there was no, there was no government regulation. That doesn't mean there was no regulation. In fact, in the early 1800s, it became obvious to pharmacists, to drug makers, and to physicians and health, other healthcare practitioners that they needed some sort of standardization so that we understand if I'm, if I'm recommending that you take, let's say, aspirin, uh, everybody understands what I mean by aspirin, what it's, you know, it's purity, what we consider pure aspirin, what we consider the proper dose. So a, a voluntary organization got created that exists to this day called the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. I think I'm pronouncing it right, or maybe it's pharmacopoeia, but I think it's pharmacopoeia. And eventually, this, so this, there's like a convention that's still maintained voluntarily where everybody agrees on the nomenclature. What we, it's, like a, this is an, it's a standard that we all know we're all talking about the same thing. And eventually, this U.S. pharmacopoeia developed uh, the national formulary, which is basically a compendium of what they consider to be every single drug they know, medic, you know for medical use in existence. And there's a description of each one, uh, you know, it, 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 how many milligrams of this, how many milligrams of that, uh, and, and what it's used for. So that, that existed already. There was a lot of clamoring in the, in the press in the early 20th century about people being sold what we call snake oil. Uh, as a, that was an expression used where people would be sold products that uh, didn't, were, were basically sugar water and they were telling them it was something else. So they were being defrauded. Or they were being sold products that, that were poisonous, they, they had arsenic in them, or, or, or they had uh, high concentrations of alcohol, or even opium without the, the, per, the customer being told this. And so there was a lot of you know, bad press about this. So this led to the first legislation, the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. And with, well, one of the things it did was it codified the U.S. pharmacopoeia. So basically, the, gov the federal government said the, the formulary and the, and the standards uh, that have already been developed through spontaneous order in civil society under the name of U.S. Pharmacopoeia hereby are officially considered the standards and formula, uh, formula for the United States. So that the whole, we, this is what we're going to be talking about going forward. So that's one thing it did. And also penalized people for not disclosing if their product has any uh, adulteration with products that could be harmful. And they established the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry, which was going to make uh, random testing of these products to see if it's what they say it is. Now, you could defend that on the grounds that fraud, of course, is, is a form of force, and this is basically the government pretending that, uh, 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 making sure that there's no fraud uh, being perpetrated on people. So that, that, that's totally acceptable. By the mid-1920s, the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry became the U.S. Uh, food and uh, uh, food, Drug and uh, Insecticide Administration. And then in the 1930s, it got renamed the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Now, something happened in 1938 that was very crucial. Um, the first antibiotic ever to exist was created called sulfonilamide. This is a miracle because up until then, infectious disease was one of the most common causes of death, and now we had a weapon. And they wanted uh, a company called Massengill in, in Tennessee wanted to develop uh, a, a liquid form that they could give to children who can't take pills or to people who had trouble with, with swallowing. And so they came up with a liquid form. And it turns out that the solvent that sulfonilamide uh, was dissolved in was diethylene glycol, which is related to ethylene glycol or antifreeze. As a result, um, there were 105 deaths from poisoning, and 90 of them in children. Interestingly, 90% of all of these uh, people who died, the sulfonilamide was prescribed to them by doctors. And there were many instances well documented in the, in the press of uh, like a mother calling the doctor and saying, my daughter's getting worse and worse and worse. And the doctor said, OK, double up on the sulfonilamide. That she was being poisoned from the sulfonilamide. So, and this gets back to, so we need prescriptions, we need permission slips, okay, so they, they prescribed this. All right, so this uh, led to uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, and basically what it said is, okay, from this point forward, no drug, no new drug can be brought to market until we've been persuaded, we the Food and Drug Administration, have been persuaded that it's safe. That's all. Any drug that's already been on the market, 
by definition is safe because we haven't had problems, so they're grandfathered. Which is why in the United States today, believe it or not, many people don't know this, there's, you could still get one form of insulin over the counter. It's regular and NPH insulin, and it's as cheap as can be for about 25 bucks, you can get it in, uh, if you, chances are if you went into like a Walgreens or CVS in the US and went up to the counter and the, the, the clerk would say, you, I, can't, I can't give you insulin without a prescription, and you say, can I speak to the pharmacist please? And the pharmacist will know, yeah, I want the, I want the, uh, the regular insulin. And the pharmacist will sell it to you. And, and I think they, they're branded, like, I think in Walgreens it's called Rely On. But so th they were a grandfather, okay? And that's why we, those exist. But all the other insulins are not, because they came subsequently. So, but even then, when the legislation was passed, just to show you how rapidly we went downhill, if you look at the record, the, the, the authors of the legislation said nothing in this legislation is intended in any way to infringe on the right of people to self-medicate. This is 1938. It's only intended to make self-medication safer. Now, you could argue, and Jessica Flanagan argues, that, well, you know what? I appreciate you checking to th whether or not it's safe. That's good information for me. But I still reserve the right to make my own decision if I want to take it or not. So even that is an infringement of our right to self-medicate. But, you know, in terms of reform, I'm not going to die on that hill, okay? If, if it was left to just that, it's hard to, it's, it's very difficult to convince people that even that is, a, is a, a, a infringement. Well, that, that was working well, and up until about 1950, many people, well, first of all, even before the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed, about 30% of people who got drugs at a pharmacy had got them because their doctor would prescribe it. But a prescription was the doctor's recommendation in writing as to what the doctor thinks you should take. People would go into a pharmacy as late as 1951, and they do that here, I know, in a lot of places, and tell a pharmacist, my doctor gave me this prescription, and the pharmacist could say, um, what does he give you this for? And you tell him, and you say, you know, that's, that's good, but I know something even better that I would recommend. And, or people would go to a pharmacist directly and say, what do you recommend for this, 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 this? And, you know, you're an autonomous adult, and you may decide, you, you, you know what, I, I want to trust the pharmacist's recommendation over the physician's recommendation. I'm going to make the choice to do what the pharmacist suggests. And that's, you can do that here in many places, except in, in maybe in Bogota and, and Medellin, it might be enforced or something. I don't know. I've been told it's hard to do in some places. In Mexico, you, anybody see um, on Netflix, uh, uh, The Queen's Gambit? They're great. Do you remember one of the greatest lines in that, in that movie, in my opinion, was when she went down into the hotel and she said, I need, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Librium, which was a, is a tranquilizer. She said, I need some Librium. Could you get a doctor to get me a prescription for Librium? And, and the, the person from the hotel says, uh, Mad Madam, you don't need a prescription for Librium in Mexico. And I said, yes. And that's, <laughs> so anyway, so, um, in, in 19, by 1951, what would happen was there are a lot of, a lot of people, uh, some drug makers would make their own proprietary decision that, you know, this drug is complicated, somebody's going to use it the wrong way, and then there's going to be problems, we're going to get sued. Let's, let's uh, stipulate that a pharmacist could sell this drug, but they have to sell it to somebody who has a prescription from a doctor. That's, that's, that's the terms of our willing to sell it. And that way we're covered because the doctor is taking responsibility off of our hands. And that's perfectly, you know, I think everybody in this room would agree that, you know, the, the pharmacist, pharmaceutical company has a right to decide uh, under what circumstances they want to sell it. Well, in 1951, there were many pharmacists, uh, uh, there, were, there were some drug companies that would sell a drug and require a prescription, and another competing company may make the same drug and not require a prescription. So pharmacists were getting into problems because sometimes as the person's walking out the door, they read, oh my goodness, I was supposed to get a prescription from that one. That's the other company. I'm going to get in trouble, you know? And so it led to problems. It would be much harder for that to happen today with, of course, with, you know, the computer technology we have. So many of you may have heard of Hubert Humphrey. Uh, he was the vice president of the United States under Lyndon Johnson, and he ran for president. Before that, he was a senator, and before that, he was a pharmacist. And there was a... a, a a pharmacist from North Carolina who became a congressman named Carl Durham. So they were the people that the pharmacists went to in Congress when they had issues because they were pharmacists. So the Durham-Humphrey Amendment was passed in 1951 and said, okay, from now on, we're going to get rid of the problem you have, you pharmacists have with making those mistakes. The FDA is going to decide from this point forward what's over the counter and what's prescription only. 
So it's taken out of the hands of, of private actors to decide how to work it out. And that's when, um, um, of course, this whole thing became subject to whatever happens when the government's involved in it. It becomes not necessarily based on science. It's based on politics. It's based on special interest pleading. And also a lot of the incumbents learn how to use the system to their advantage. Uh, later on, in, in the mid-60s, uh, the Kefauver harris Amendment was passed. I, I don't want to get into too much detail. It's all in, in my paper. But it's, this is relevant. Up until 1962, it was considered up to the practitioners to dis, dis, decide on the efficacy of various drugs. Uh, and we still do. Uh, you can't pick up a medical journal or go to a medical conference without the presentation being about the efficacy of drug A versus drug B for the treatment of condition X. That's what we do, okay? So um, there was a, 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 the famous thalidomide scandal that occurred in 1962 where a drug that had not yet been approved and is an excellent drug, by the way, for nausea and was used to treat uh, mul uh, multiple myeloma and leprosy, just if you take it for nausea, make sure you're not pregnant because they were giving it to women for morning sickness and they were having horrendous birth defects, children born without limbs. It was all over the news. Uh, and it was happening here in this country even though it wasn't approved because doctors were giving it to their patients uh, uh, as research. They had, they had agreements with the drug companies to do research. And it, the patients, by the way, didn't even know. They, they weren't told that this is research. It's not been approved yet. They were just told, why don't you try this? So they didn't give informed consent. Um, and so suddenly Congress had to go into, uh, move it into action. Um, like I say, thalidomide is still used for a lot of things. So the Keith Albert Harris amendments were passed. And I, I still, for the life of me, can't figure out the connection. But they said, from this point forward, you also have to prove efficacy. Now, what that has to do, the, the thalidomide was very efficacious for nausea. It still is. Just don't take it when you're pregnant. So I don't know why they added this provision that now you have to prove efficacy. But that added, on average, 10 years and, and uh, over a billion dollars to, to the cost of the production of any drug. Uh, now, the irony of this, this is very interesting. Once it's approved, it's, it's, it, the label says it's approved for the use for the treatment of this condition. Now, once it's approved, physicians, or health, let me just say healthcare practitioners, because you, know, you could be a nurse practitioner or whatever. You're, um, you're free to prescribe it for anything you want, because you could have read some journal articles saying it might work for this. We're hearing this now with uh, some people wanting ivermectin for COVID. That's called off-label use, which means the label is only permitted for what the application was for, but anything else, you're permitted to use it. So legally, a, a physician could prescribe a drug for anything they want. So you might say, well, wait a minute. So you maybe wait 10 years and deny people who were waiting, who were suffering until that drug was available for 10 years to permit me to, pre to prescribe it for condition A, but then for B through Z, you trust my judgment because I'm a doctor. You just use your judgment. Well, why couldn't you use my judgment for condition A through Z instead of B through Z? Look at all the, all the problems we create. But that's what exists today. And to this day, in the United States, 20% of all drugs are off-label prescribed. And then the other thing that's important, the next intrusion on our right is the medical device amendments of 1976. Now, th this is also relevant. In, the, uh, in 1971, this company called Faraday made urine tests to test for pregnancy. They started selling it directly to consumers. Uh, it was the first urine pregnancy test. It was the exact same test that if you went to your obstetrician or your family physician, they would use in their office. No different. It was proven to work, okay? Uh, and the policy of the FDA when it came to tests or devices, they call them, um, was we don't, you don't have to get approval to bring it to the market. We do a post-market review, and if we see there's problems with it or that it doesn't do what it's, what it's been sold as to be able to do, then we could order it off the market. Well, they were very concerned about these women doing pregnancy tests, so they ordered Faraday to take it off the market. And Faraday went to court and said, why are you ordering to take it off the market? This, this is the exact test that doctors are using in their offices. This isn't, uh, we're not, you know, lying. Uh, and uh, the, the judge ordered uh, the FDA to allow it to get back on the market. The FDA argued before the court, well, we're not, compl we're not claiming that the test doesn't work as, as advertised. We're concerned that a woman who learns she's pregnant might not use that information wisely, okay? 
That was the justification. So the court overturned uh, the government, so the government had to do something about that. So they added the Medical Device Act in 1976, which is an amendment to the Food and Drug Act, and that says, okay, from this point forward, you have to get pre-market approval before you can put a test on the market. And that's led to all sorts of problems, which I'll get to in a minute. So all of these infringements have their consequences. So for example, you would think as an economist, making a drug prescription only would make the prices possibly go lower because you're restricting the, your market if it's prescription only, so you have a smaller amount of demand. That might drive your prices down. Why is it that we know in the United States, usually, and this has been empirically demonstrated by many health economists, when a drug goes from prescription only to over the counter, when it's reclassified, prices drop. Well, in our country, and I imagine in most countries of the world today, it's because we have a third party payer system. So in our country, insurance companies are required to pay for prescription drugs, but not over the counter drugs. So the, the manufacturers actually kind of like this idea that it's prescription only because they could charge, if they want to get, let's say, $100 for a drug, they could charge $300 to the, drug, to the third party payer, whether it's the government or the insurance company. And of course, the third party payers say, I'm not going to give you 300, I'll give you 150. And they say, OK, I'll take 150 because they wanted 100 anyway. We doctors do that all the time, too, when we negotiate prices with insurance companies or you know, third party payers. So the third party, of course, is responsible for interfering with the, the, uh, the interaction between the consumer and the, and the producer or provider of the service. And, and so you have this interference with, the, with allowing the pricing system to work. And, and when uh, prescription drugs are made over the counter, all of a sudden people start comparison shopping. They're wondering, why is this one $4, and this one $6? What's the difference? They ask the pharmacist questions, and they, they're much more involved. So that's one thing. Other things, though. Uh, for example, there's a, a process, uh, uh, there is a phenomenon that economists call drug lag and drug loss. Drug lag is the, the delay, the, have, how people have to wait, sometimes years, maybe even die waiting for a drug to satisfy the FDA that can be brought to market. In some cases, you, it's available in other countries and you can go to another country to get it. If you have anybody seen the movie Dallas Buyers Club, that's a true story. And that's a, that's a, a fantastic example of how the FDA killed people. Um, but there's many other examples. For example, uh, and politics is sometimes involved too. It's not necessarily the, the pharmaceutical company. So in the United States, uh, the, uh, the FDA approved uh, uh, Plan B, which is the morning after pill, okay? It, uh, they approved that in 1999 uh, uh, for over-the-counter over use, no, for, I'm sorry, for prescription use, for prescription use. In 2003, an advisory panel of the FDA, 24 to 3, recommended that the FDA make it over the counter. The Bush administration overruled the FDA and kept it prescription only. There was a lot of, of, uh, of uh, lobbying from social conservatives who were afraid that it, the morning after pill will encourage sexual promiscuity. So as long as we didn't have a morning after pill, nobody's going to be sexually promiscuous. It's amazing. So anyway, um, finally a court uh, uh, I'm sorry, public opinion made the Bush administration relent and they allowed it to be over the counter but only for 18 and up. Then in 2000, that was in 2008. 2009, the court uh, 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 ordered the Bush administration, uh, the uh, next administration, the Obama administration, to make it available for 17 and up. Finally, the Food and Drug Administration overwhelmingly wanted to make it available for all women because it's really harmless. In fact, a bottle of Tylenol, you sell Tylenol to a a 12-year-old can go into a store, buy a bottle of Tylenol. That's much more deadly and dangerous than buying uh, the morning after pill. Um, and President Obama, and if, you, if you'll see on our, on our uh, even on the PDF version of our white paper, it's an inside joke. You see on the, 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 uh, the illustration as a picture of a box of, of uh, chewing gum and a box of uh, Plan B. Because President Obama said, I don't want kids to be able to go buy uh, plan B along with, you know, chewing gum at the checkout counter. So that was our, a little inside joke to ourselves when we made the illustration. But so Obama did not want to make it available until finally 2013, a federal court ordered it be available over the counter for everybody. So it took 14 years for a drug that was over the counter for women in most of the developed world to finally become over the counter in the United States. Other examples, uh, this is where the drug companies uh, like things to, to be, uh, um, 
remain prescription only. So the antihistamine Benadryl is over the counter. It's always for years, okay? Now it's makes it's so sedating that uh, the federal, the FAA will not allow pilots, commercial pilots, to fly if they've taken Benadryl because it makes them drowsy. In the mid '90s, uh, Claritin and then Allegra and Zyrtec were invented. These were the first non-sedating antihistamines. They're available by prescription only, so you can get a dangerous drug that you can crash your car or your airplane with over the counter, but you need a prescription for a non-sedating version of that drug. Now, Shearing Plow, the makers of Claritin, was lobbying all over the European versions of the FDA, telling them you should make this over the counter. This is fantastic. It's safe safer than Benadryl, and so it was over the counter in Europe. In the, in the United States, because it was prescription only, you had to get a prescription and the insurance companies had to pay for it. So in 1999, WellPoint, a major insurance co company, was saying, you know, these prescriptions for Claritin are killing us. So they asked the FDA if they could consider making it over the counter so they wouldn't have to pay for it. Shearing Plow, at the same time that was telling Europe, you should make this over the counter, it's so safe, they testified before Congress saying, no, 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 it's too dangerous to make it over the counter. It needs to be prescription only. So that, why? Because we want to be able to overcharge WellPoint. You know, we get twice what we get if it was over the counter. Finally, in 2007, I think, it became over the counter, as did the competitors. So these are, this is how things work. Then let's get to testing. Um, I'm old enough to remember, I was in practice at the time when the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, came on the scene in the early 80s. And unlike COVID, which has a 99.98% survival rate, if you were diagnosed with HIV AIDS, that was a death sentence. It was, it was just horrif horrifying. And by, of course, the Dallas Buyers Club talks about how treatments for that were being held up by the FDA, but also testing. So in the late 1980s, a, a company developed an at-home test that you could self-administer to test to see if you're HIV positive. And they wanted to market it, but the FDA said, you can't. And in fact, they wouldn't even consider applications, and, and they didn't consider any applications until the early 21st century. Why? Not because we, because we define efficacy as how it's used, and we're worried that if a person discovers he or she is HIV positive, instead of getting medical help, they'll commit suicide, so we're not allowing it. Well, that's not efficacy, is it? I mean, efficacy is, does it work? The test works. You shouldn't be concerned about a normative uh, issue about people deciding how to use it, but that's, what, that's how this thing gets stretched. And COVID, so in, in, in the United States, the first COVID self-administered at-home test became a, it developed in, I think, October of 2020, but the FDA wouldn't allow it to be gotten without a prescription. It wasn't until about February or March that they allowed one to be purchased over the counter like at a, a supermarket or drugstore, and they were already doing that in Europe for months. Um, and then there's this 23andMe and, 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 and genetic screening test that to this day, they could diagnose more than 200 uh, uh, genetic predispositions to various health issues, but they've only been allowed to, I think, so far uh, provide about 30 of them, because the FDA is holding it up because they're concerned how people will use this information, which shouldn't be anything they're concerned with. So I think I'm probably having to move along here. So another thing that's important to note is uh, oral contraceptives. They're available in 102 countries over the counter. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has been for 20 years saying, you don't need to see a doctor, just it's safe, you should be able to get it over the counter. But it's still prescription only in the United States. So a woman has to, you know, take time off from work, maybe wait two hours in the waiting room because the doctor's running late, and spend $100 for a medical appointment to get a prescription that they're going to get, because they know they're going to get it. And the doctor's thinking, you don't need to see me. But that, why? Well, it's a bootleggers and Baptist story in the United States. You got, for the same reason as Plan B, you have social conservatives holding up, uh, making it over the counter, because they're afraid that if, if, if you can get birth control pills over the counter, there will be a whole lot of sex going on. And then it, the, 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 uh, uh, the left is also against it because even though they want women to, be, to have autonomy, uh, not if you got to pay for it, because if it's over the counter, then the insurance won't pay for it. So they want autonomy and liberty for women as long as you don't have to pay for it. So that, the two of them are teaming up to keep it from getting approved for over the counter in the United States. Insulin, you can get insulin over the counter in Canada and in Singapore and Tanzania. Uh, statin drugs like Lipitor, you can get over the counter in the UK. Uh, salbutamol inhaler, which in the United States is called albuterol, over the counter in Australia, Mexico, Singapore, and Sweden. 
And naloxone, the, over the, the, uh, the, anti the opioid antidote to opioid overdose drug, is over the counter in Italy, Australia, Canada, and Mexico. But the United States, you need a prescription. They've come up with some workarounds, which I'll get to later, but you still need a prescription for it. Now, you also have to ask yourself, do the FDAs in, in the rest of the world, are they all careless about their people? Are they willing to allow people to get over-the-counter stuff? Are they crazy? We're, we're much smarter than they are. And that, you know, the, the British are making a big mistake letting people get over-the-counter statin drugs. No, I, I don't think so. I think this is all a matter of, you know, politics and, uh, and, and special interest pleading. Um, there's uh, evidence that, there's actually empiric evidence that people are much more cautious when they self-medicate. They comparison shop, they do research, they do due diligence, they ask a lot of questions. In fact, uh, the University of Washington in Seattle did a study, they asked women to pre-screen themselves to see if they were good candidates to take or uh, oral contraceptives. And they were in agreement with obstetrician gynecologists 90% of the time. The 10% of the time they were not in agreement it's because they thought, no, nah, I don't think I should take it. And the doctor said, yeah, you could take it. So does that mean the doctors were making a mistake and were taking more risks with, the, with these patients' lives than the patients would? Possible, but there's certainly, the point is that people are more cautious. Am I running a little out of time here? How am I doing? Okay? Okay. Um, so what can we do? Well, first of all, ideally, I would like to eliminate government-imposed prescription requirements, let it go back to being where the, the private sector made these decisions. Now, obviously, in, with all of the complex pharmaceuticals that exist today that didn't exist then, I don't think you're going to see a dramatic change. You know, companies that make chemotherapy for cancer or these complex biologics, they're going to require a prescription. But the fact that they will have the liberty to make adjustments without having to get government permission will make a big difference. And a lot of the everyday routine drugs like we're talking about up until now, from birth control pills to antihistamines, they will automatically you know, become over the counter. Um, we, could, we should reconsider the, the pre-market approval requirements. For example, before the FDA started doing pre-market approval, there were already mechanisms in place that the, the civil society had developed. For example, the American Medical Association had its committee on, on chemistry and uh, the Council on Pharmacy and Chemistry that basically they said to the drug companies, if you want us to give a seal of approval on your product, and to allow you to advertise in the medical journals that our doctors read, you have to let us inspect it, run tests on it, and make it pass judgment. And most of the major companies, the reputable ones like Pfizer or Merck, they said, you know what, we'd rather have their seal of approval than be these uh, people on the street selling snake oil. And so that was already in effect, and in the mid-1950s, it, it disbanded because it was crowded out by the government and no longer had any reason to exist. Uh, you, st you still have the U.S. Pharmacopeia, you have the, have the national formulary, and up until uh, even as, as late as the 1960s, the Food and Drug Administration farmed out to the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences, a private organization, to do all of, it, of its efficacy testing post-market approval. So there, the, 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 the infrastructure is already there, and now it should be even, there's even more infrastructure that can readily mobilize. Um, the, the U.S. Pharmacopeia recognizes in its national formulary the off-label uses of drugs about two and a half years on average quicker than the, the FDA does. Another interesting thing that would happen if we allowed for the, you know, a lot of our licensing laws, which is a topic for a different day, and a lot of our regulations actually discriminate against the development of integrated uh, healthcare systems like Kaiser Permanente in the United States, um, where the, instead of getting paid fee for service, they're getting paid for outcomes. So you give them an, a monthly fee and you go there and get this integrated health care. If the primary care doctor wants to bring in a, an ENT specialist, they just you know, send you down the hall to the end. It's all one group. Well, there's a very big one in the United States, for example, Kaiser Permanente. Um, and they themselves would likely want to do their own testing and, 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 and uh, due diligence on not only efficacy but also on off-label uses because the uh, benefits of doing so are internalized in, the, in their cost structure. Remember, they're prepaid. So that's another uh, way in which if we had an unencumbered marketplace, things would, would, uh, would take care of it. Uh, what can we do in the meantime that's more politically realistic? Well, uh, economist Sam Peltzman at the University of Chicago in the 1980s suggested 
Now, we could put, for example, uh, we could, a law could be passed that says that after an FDA-approved drug that's prescription only has reached a certain milestone, let's say, for example, a certain amount of doses, millions of doses given, uh, and uh, has had a risk profile uh, that looks good after a certain, like, for example, we had this issue about full approval of the vaccine in the United States. 350 million doses given over eight months, no significant complications that the FDA still hasn't given a full approval. So you could pass a law saying once it reaches a certain milestone, a certain threshold, uh, it is now officially up to the manufacturer to decide if they want to make it over the counter or keep it prescription only, but it's no longer in the hands of the FDA because it's, set, it's met that milestone. That's one reform proposal. Um, there's also intermediate classifications. In many countries in Europe, you don't just have prescription only and over the counter, you have pharmacist only, where you don't have to go to a doctor, but you have to go talk to somebody who's like uh, a, a buffer between you and the medicine. So for example, in Canada, if you wanted to go and buy insulin, which you could, the pharmacist there who you gotta buy it from would say, so do you have diabetes? And if you say, well, I'm pretty sure I do because I have all the symptoms of my friend and my friend has diabetes and he's taking this insulin, so that's why I want to start taking it. The pharmacist could say in Canada, well, you know what? I don't think I want to sell it to you. Uh, why don't you go see a doctor and, and then come back to see me if the doctor thinks you need it? The, so that's a, a third category that if we had a market system, maybe a lot of pharmacy manufacturers would opt for that category. It's, 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 they think it doesn't really need to be prescription only, but we don't want to take chances completely, so we want to have some sort of educated person as a buffer. And then um, many uh, another uh, in the European Union, uh, if a drug is approved by one European member country's version of the FDA, it's automatically recognized in the other countries. So a French-approved drug is okay in Germany and vice versa. In New Zealand and Australia, any U.S. FDA-approved drug is okay in those countries. Singapore is the same way. So. Another thing we could do in the United States is say you have the option of purchasing an FDA approved drug or uh, a drug that's approved by the FDA equivalent of you know, this particular list of countries. It's up to you. And it would have to, you could make it where it has to say on there, this is not approved by the FDA of the United States, it's approved by the FDA of Canada. And then you decide, and, and that's another possible option. And actually this is not that crazy an idea because so far, Senator Ted Cruz and Mike Lee in the United States have introduced a bill, they call it the RESULT Act. Of course, it hasn't gone anywhere. Guess who's opposed to it? The pharmaceutical companies, and they've been lobbying hard against it, but they've introduced a bill to do just that. And then finally, uh, states can take steps to uh, improve autonomy because under the regulations, uh, when an FDA designates a drug prescription only, that means in writing, it can only be given uh, with a prescription from a healthcare practitioner licensed by the state. In the United States, each state has autonomy in this area. So the state could decide which of its licensed healthcare practitioners can do what they want to do. That's called scope of practice. So for example, every state in the United States has decided a while ago that pharmacists can provide vaccinations. You don't have to go to a doctor to get a vaccination. You can go to a drugstore. Um, in several states now, that work around because naloxone is prescription only is the states have allowed pharmacists to prescribe naloxone. They're a licensed healthcare practitioner, so we're saying they can prescribe it. Um, in nine states now, they've allowed pharmacists to prescribe birth control pills. So you don't, now you still, I got a problem where you have to go to another adult and say, may I please have this? But at least I don't have to take an afternoon off of work and spend $100 to get the permission slip. I can get it for free you know, on the way home from work when I stop at the drugstore. So it's better. It's better than the, the status quo. And uh, three states so far have allowed uh, what they call PrEP and PEP. That's pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, which are incredibly effective against HIV. They've allowed uh, people to purchase it directly from a pharmacist by the pharmacist prescribing it because it's prescription only drug. And that's another, so, and then you can come up with a whole list of things that you can move uh, the authority to prescribe to the pharmacist. Like, why, why, you know, why can't I go to the pharmacist and have the pharmacist prescribe, uh, perform the test to see if I have influenza, and if I do, prescribe Tamiflu, which is a drug for that to me. Or why can't I go to the pharmacist and have them do a thing on my throat, to, a swab test to see if I have a strep throat, and if I have it, prescribe 
penicillin for me? Why do I have to go to a doctor when the doctor's going to use that same kit and he just gets to charge me more and I have to take time off from work? So these are all things we could move to the, to the pharmacist level. Again, it's not my choice, but it's a whole lot better than the status quo. And then, so I don't forget, you may remember earlier on I said that we should, you might want to make an exception for antibiotics. In Mexico, everything is over the counter except for antibiotics, even though that's not strongly enforced. There, you can make an argument for this because we've seen antibiotics are so liberally prescribed by doctors nowadays that we're developing a real problem around the world of antibiotic resistant organisms. So, and, and in fact, the World Health Organization has, has, a, has a committee working on that. It's, it's actually reaching uh, almost emergency uh, levels. So that you know, people are suddenly finding that they can't, that bacterial infections that used to respond readily to antibiotics are now back to the way it was 100 years ago when the antibiotics aren't working. So overutilization of antibiotics, you could argue that, that that has an externality problem where you're affecting the flora, which affects all of the other people around you and puts them at risk. So you could make an argument, at least with some antibiotics, depends on the category of antibiotic, that you could still require some you know, licensed healthcare practitioner who knows more about the appropriate use of the antibiotic to, to grant permission for you to get an antibiotic to give to yourself. And I can see that argument. And uh, that's it, I'll take any questions. I don't know how much time we have. Mm -hmm. So, in your in your experience, uh, how can we approach this conversation to make people more aware of that's important that the right to self medicate And you made the point at the beginning with recreational drugs and yeah. the other type of drugs. Because I feel people still feel very uncomfortable talking about this. Right. And how can we open up that conversation? Well, yeah. This this talk was a mix of um, of philosophy and, and policy. So, um, but. I think the best way is for things like, for example, has everybody, everybody here seen that movie, The Dallas Buyers Club, by the way, with Matthew McConaughey? If you haven't, you could, it's available very, it's, it's probably for free on YouTube at this point. Definitely watch it. It is so emotional and you find yourself getting so angry and so sympathetic with the, with the character. So to me, uh, I've, I've learned dealing, you know, in the world of public policy, that you're right, numbers are very good when you're talking to, you know, the committee staff of a member of the, of the legislature or a member of the central government, but when you're dealing with the public, it's stories that work. So I think the most effective way of doing this is to give true life illustrations about people who are dying, who, who have to travel to another country to get a treatment that people there have been getting because they can't get it here, or when it's finally made available to them, it's too late. And those kind of things, I think that's the best approach to take. Over here. So, uh, so I have an interesting question that uh, you may have already considered making the light paper. I apologize if uh, it's somewhere in there and you can bring it up in the presentation. There's this weird um, synergistic effect when you um, take these principles that you're talking about, about self-medication, and combine them with public health systems. For example, Germany and I think a couple other countries in the EU are doing now about value-based equations for their formulary that they, they offer in their public systems, which means that uh, if there's a new oncology drug, it actually does a cost-benefit analysis where they determine, well, it's got a little higher efficacy, but it's more expensive. So, you know, that extra um, year and a half of life that you could expect from this drug, it really isn't worth it, so therefore we're not going to offer in the uh, healthcare system, so yeah. that, um, you know, with the potential government expansion of healthcare all around the world on the horizon, including the United States, with potential Medicaid for <laughs> for all, not Medicare, it's more like Medicaid for all. Um, what impact will this have on pharmaceuticals and uh, development, and also the price? Well, well, I can give you a great story right now. Um, many of you, at least if you're from the United States, have heard about this. Big controversy, the FDA 
uh, approved uh, a drug called Adihelm, which is the, uh, an, an Alzheimer's drug. And um, for years, doctors have been debating. We know that people with Alzheimer's disease have these development of these amyloid plaques in their brain, uh, but we don't necessarily know are those plaques the cause of the dementia, or are they a byproduct of whatever is causing their dementia, like an underlying inflammatory action? It's still a subject of much debate, and we don't know the answer. So finally, for the first time in about 20 years, uh, uh, Biogen came up with a drug that actually does reduce the number of plaques. However, in most studies, it hasn't been shown in any way to affect the, the dementia, but it does reduce the plaques. The FDA decided to approve it, and uh, came under a lot of criticism because they're saying, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of experts say, you shouldn't have approved it, it doesn't work. It didn't pass the efficacy trials. Well, in our country, for example, Medicare is, based upon existing laws, virtually has to cover every drug that's approved by the FDA. There are certain exceptions that they could make certain allowances, but then there's also politics that come into play. The people over age 65 who are covered by Medicare are a huge voting lobby. And if they hear that there's a chance that this drug could help me for my Alzheimer's disease, they're going to demand it. And they're going to be very unhappy if they don't get it. So there's, I don't think there's ever been an instance where a drug approved by the FDA was not covered by Medicare, for example. So there's a perfect example. Uh, in our system, we generally have a fee-for-service system. When you have a, 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 an integrated healthcare system like Kaiser Permanente, they could say, well, you know, we're just not going to include it on our formulary because we decided not to. Cleveland Clinic announced they're not going to include it on their formulary. Uh, I think so did uh, uh, Blue Cross of North Carolina, an, an insurance company. Now, in our country, if you, it, that doesn't mean you can't have it. It just means the insurance company is not going to pay for it. You're free to use your own money and get it. Uh, but but it, clearly, it's easier to do in some other countries where, where, where the the public doesn't have as many options and also doesn't have the uh, political clout to get th the coverage that they want. A lot of, I, my understanding is a lot of countries, these decisions are made by independent bodies that are less subject to, to political pressure than they are in the United States. Um, congratulations, a fantastic uh, overview about the FDA, but my point is about, my question about international competition on regulations. Mm -hmm. For example, in Europe, you can buy metformin. Anyone can buy metformin, no problem. And I recommended that to Ken, um, so that he buys some metformin, and maybe here in Colombia. And in uh, Japan, they are allowing many experimental treatments for um, older people, aging people, and people who are basically also dying of any condition, so you can try any experimental procedures. So don't we need more international competition uh, in the FDA so that the FDA sees what other countries are doing? Yeah, no, I agree completely. And I, and I think I kind of addressed that towards the end. Uh, one proposal out there that would do that, um, that is politically workable, you know, you could, has a chance politically, is to say that Americans could purchase uh, products that are approved by whatever agency equivalent of, of the FDA in you know, a list of countries. You can give a list of approved countries. So you know, again, you want it to pass. So you may not have, you know, you may not have uh, Botswana on that list. You may not have uh, uh, Nepal on that list, but you certainly have most, every EU country, Switzerland, Japan, uh, Singapore, uh, Israel, and you know, if, if it's approved, and all it's stipulated is that this is approved, metformin is approved, you know, uh, in, well, actually, I don't know if they could do the over-the-counter thing, because the FDA still controls that. But, but the drug that is not yet approved by the United States FDA is approved by the German FDA. And you, when you go buy it at the store, it says, not approved by US FDA, approved by German FDA. And then you say, OK, well, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with the German FDA. He says, oh, I'm going to go ahead and buy it. And so that's one way to, to stimulate. Because are the Germans, do they care that much less about their people than the American FDA does? I don't think so. There's so much political and special interest pleading involved in the approval process, clearly. And, and we see so many variations between what you can get in some countries and in other countries. So I think that that's an actual proposal. It's been that that's, the, the bill has been introduced twice already. Once it gets introduced, even though right now it's been introduced by Republicans, so it's not going to go anywhere. But 
once it gets introduced once, you're already making progress because now the idea has suddenly gotten credibility. It was introduced in a, an actual legislative form so it could have a chance next go around to kind of get resurrected. Thank you, that'll be for today. Please give it up to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're going to take the official picture, so see you right now.